All right, so um, I thought I'll just go through a little bit about that distribution of Tsog section and the Song of the Spring Queen, and then the offering of the remaining Tsog. And if that doesn't cover any questions that you had, then we'll have time for some questions. So a um, little bit on the distribution part. So the distribution part of Tsog is verses 70 to 75 is the Song of the Spring Queen, or also known as the Song to Move the Takini's Hearts. And it's the one that goes, That one is when the song actually is distributed to the assembly. So the question becomes, what is a Dakini? <laughs> so there's a few different words that you hear in Tantra. You hear goddess, which is Lamo, in the context of offering goddesses, also god and god realm goddesses, all sorts of goddesses. You hear dakini, or in Tibetan, the word is kadro. And then you hear consort, or sherebma, or kama mudra. And these are all terms that have layers of meaning, and they really differ depending on context. So even though you'll hear the word consort in English, um, gradually building popularity is a better translation which is wisdom mother, wisdom mother. So whether we are talking about a goddess, a dakini, or a wisdom mother, those can all be mutually inclusive terms or mutually exclusive terms. It very much depends on context. So the song to move the dakini's hearts, that section that we do while we're distributing this song, we're really trying to connect with specifically dakini cadro energy. So that's what we'll talk about here. So this is from Jan Willis's book called Dharma Matters, Women, Race, and Tantra. It's a fantastic book. I really recommend it. And she says, Dakinis are said to be beings that are tricky and playful. The term is thus sometimes glossed by translations like sky dancer or sky enjoyer, which is ka dro in Tibetan. They're often described as wrathful or semi-wrathful deities though it is also recognized that they may have human or other animate or inanimate form as well. In some contexts, they are termed demonical beings or witches. One scholar seemed to like to call them furies. Others have referred to them as sprites and fairies. They've been called genii of meditation. For tantric adepts, they are viewed as messengers or prophetesses or protectresses and inspirers. Additionally, they are at times regarded as rikmas or mystic consorts. And most inclusive of all, within Buddhist tantric contexts, Dakini is viewed as the supreme embodiment of the highest wisdom itself. Embracing such wisdom, one becomes Buddha. So I, this is Jan, believe that it is the latter sense of Dakini that is the embodiment of the highest wisdom and the symbolic concretization of the direct, unmediated and non-conceptual experience of voidness that makes the term so difficult to discuss. For in the ultimate, absolute and final sense, she stands for ineffable reality itself. In a tantric universe replete with symbols, Dakini, one may say, is the symbol par excellence and being preeminently, constitutively, and inherently symbolic, the Dakini always remains a symbol within the Tibetan symbolic world. As such, she serves always only to represent and suggest, even for the tantric adept, other and deeper non-discursive experiential meanings. Inevitably then, she remains elusive to academic, or intellectual analysis. So there's a number of notes that go with that passage. And so if you're curious, you can look at the notes some other time. But when we talk about Dakinis, you know, your first thought maybe goes to Kadrula in our tradition, um, in our organization, who is one of the oracles of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And, you know, she has a wrathful aspect um, and she gives, uh, she's the oracle of the deity Serima and gives advice to his holiness. But 
she also has this very peaceful, very uh, leadership, very mentorship aspect, like here where she's blessing the sea creatures with prayers and mantras. So someone like Kadrala is very hard to pin down what she actually is. But when you see her in this aspect, when she's channeling the deity Seringma, she is fierce and she's intimidating negative states of mind. But she's actually basically a nun, just without the three changes of appearance, name, and thought. She has the precepts from the tradition of Marpa, which includes celibacy. So she's like a, a nun who doesn't have to wear robes and doesn't have quite as many vows as regular nuns. But she's completely celibate and um, her life is devoted to the spiritual path. And you see her in these various contexts and you really do wonder what's going on there. It's a very interesting thing to look at. So a Dakini, I think, is useful to frame in some sort of reference that we have in the Western world, but realize that it's not quite perfect. For me, personally, as an individual, I often think about the archetype of the muse. Like, what is the muse? What is it that inspires creativity? What is it that inspires connection? What is it that helps with depth and energy and removing blockages to practice? So that muse archetype that we, we hear about as people in the Western world, I think is similar akin to this kind of Dakini energy, which is very moving and playful. It also can be wrathful and intimidating, but only in the sense that a mother would scold her child who's about to hurt themselves, not in the sense of wanting to be domineering or um, making us subordinate or something. So when we're doing the song to move the Dakini's hearts, what we're really saying is may we be receptive and open to this muse that can help bring some life force and vitality into our path and our practice. So we say she, Dakini, there are of course also Dakas, which are the same thing only in male form, but we don't really wanna get trapped in that kind of like ordinary gender construct, societal stuff. It's not really useful in this context. I think that the concept of her in, that, in the female form conveys that sense that we're already sort of used to, you know, we were all little kids watching Fantasia once, you know, and we saw the little fairies and sprites during the Nutcracker Suite. Do you remember Fantasia, the Disney movie? Yeah, you know, like we've seen fairies and mythical creatures and, and this kind of um, sprite that's sort of mischievous, but beautiful, that's dancing and delicate, but also can turn fierce. Like we have some reference for this kind of energy but we also haven't quite married it together with it being related to wisdom. So what are we embracing in tantric practice? We're embracing wisdom. Yeah, and we're kind of connecting with and embodying the characteristics of a being who has realized emptiness directly. So this Dakini energy is something that we really have to sit with and kind of start to understand in an experiential way through our tantric practice without getting too trapped in words or form, but we need words and form to help kind of move us in the right direction. So during the song to move the Dakini's hearts, um, there is a lot of really interesting energy in the room. Some of that is just practical because people are now standing up and moving around and passing around the song. And so of course there's movement, so you feel movement but sometimes together with the movement can be um, a giddy silliness. If you're not grounded enough, then maybe you will have seen this. There's kind of a giddy silliness that can happen to the group, which is almost like we've all gotten a little bliss bombed by all the Dakinis coming into the room because we called them. Yeah, and so people sometimes get a little giddy or silly or fractious or stuff happens during the song to move the Dakinis' hearts. So if as many people as possible can stay really focused while there's lots of movement, while there's distribution, while there's some people going off the handle with their bliss bombs, either getting aggravated or getting giddy, if a few people can sort of be with the blissful, creative, energetic experience while staying grounded, it helps the puja not fall apart at this point. Okay, so just a few people anchoring the team.
Okay. Also, there's going to be new people who are just like, what is happening right now? There are snacks being distributed. What is happening? Right. So, you know, it just helps to kind of like stabilize things if a few people at least can be really focused. So do you have questions about Dakinis? I may or may not be able to answer them. Do you have questions about the SOG distribution? I may or may not be able to answer them. Can you just clarify for me when you are holding, if you're the one taking the SOG outside and you're holding it, I learned, I think backwards, that you face the altar and then you back out um, hmm. of the room. So is it, it's, you actually face the door so your face is away from most of the people and then you go out? There, there might be a few different traditions. So you'd have to ask whoever told you that, what tradition they were coming from. But um, your, your, all of the energy has been directed out the door. And it's being directed out the door to the oath-bound protectors. Some people say also to the predas and hungry ghosts. It depends on who you ask, if it's only oath-bound protectors or if it's hungry ghosts too, or if it's everybody seen and unseen, if it's the landlord spirits. Lots of people, lots of people beings are being offered the remaining tzog, but all of them we are thinking in the outside way that are somehow less able to connect with the tzog unless it has this unclean characteristic, which is why we bite it first. So because of karmic obscurations, either from their side or from our side, they're less able to access the uncontaminated pure wisdom nectar. So we slightly contaminate it so they can access it is the very, very rough, needs a lot of commentary explanation, but they're outside. So you're holding it, facing the door. Um, th what happens logistically, and maybe this is where you're coming from, is that so often the helper is not sure of what they're doing, that they wind up facing to watch the umze for cues and wind up backing out because they're watching for now, now, should I go now? So there's also that that happens. Um, there's sometimes a tradition of while it's being blessed, you face towards the group. And then once it's been blessed, you turn and face the door. So sometimes there's a turning that happens. So it could be that. Yeah, so that the, um, that part, you're facing the group. And then at the hotens in, you face the door. But so often the llama is right there that maybe people don't want to turn their back on the llama. So maybe that's where your tradition came from. It could be that, yeah, that would make sense. So there's, they normally would be facing towards the door at that point, but they don't wanna put their back to the teacher. And so they're backing out, maybe. So we'd have to unpack whoever gave you that advice. There's probably a lot of correct reasons for that. Um, yeah, and Venerable is saying one teacher said, never give Tsog to dogs. That's 100% correct. Um, don't give Tsog to any four-legged creature. Um, it's just, we don't want to create obstacles for them by them not respecting it and like gobbling it up with attachment, et cetera, lots of reasons, but yeah, don't give Tsog to your animals, even if it's in the form that's not going to make them sick. Yeah. And uh, the remaining Tsog should always go off the ground, ideally in a high place. So a lot of Dharma centers will have like a little platform where you put the remaining Tsog on. But if you don't, like I've just used a window seal outside my house off the ground, somewhat elevated. So for the next section, so we've just kind of roughly looked at the Dakini situation and the song to move the Dakini's hearts. Now we're switching to this section, which is verses 76 to 83. So the remaining song is generally thought of as being to the oath-bound protectors and or the predas, the hungry ghosts, for auspiciousness and generosity but a Lama's commentary is needed for specifics. So Predas are hungry ghosts or spirits. The Preda realm is one of the three lower realms of cyclic existence. Protectors or Dharmapalas, also called Dharma protectors, they can be worldly, but very realized, or a manifestation of the enlightened mind who protects Buddhism and its practitioners. So in the verses itself, we're very much talking about oath-bound protectors, sometimes the very obviously the worldly ones called sometimes landlord spirits. So landlord spirits may or may not be enlightened, um, but they're like the deities of the place. 
And if you've ever studied Native American spirituality or indigenous culture spirituality, it, there's a relationship there of there are enlightened beings or nearly enlightened beings associated with the land that you're on. Yeah, and as an act of generosity, connection and kindness, we want to include them in our practice and our prayers out of respect that we're on their space, but also so that they don't cause obstacles in the case that they're not enlightened beings, that they're just realized beings. So it might be that we come and arrive with our Buddhism and we just start doing our Buddhism and they're like, hey, we're doing other things. What are you doing? It's, it's not polite, right? So it's nice to kind of say, please, may we have permission to do our practices in your space. We, we come in peace and also hear our offerings from our practice. And if they're enlightened beings, it's just a nice extra offering. If they're not enlightened beings, it helps them not cause obstacles. Um, if they're non-enlightened beings who are realized and are oath-bound protectors in alignment with the Dharma, they're also, um, you know, it's a way of kind of encouraging the connection between us and them so that they support our practice in the future. So there are deities of the elements, there are daily deities of the earth, and all of these deities, whether mundane or super mundane, can be helpful or not. And so that's part of the reasons there. In the case that it's an offering to the hungry ghosts, and sometimes the lamas will direct it very specifically that way, hungry ghosts have karmic obstacles to receiving food and drink. It's one of the hardships that they experience in their rebirth. So by making this karmic connection with them and offering them this food, maybe they're able to actually access some food and drink and have some relief of suffering. So it's like an act of generosity. Um, uh, basically, if you can think similarly to how you think in Gektors, um, where any obstacles to me doing practice in this place at this time are being dispelled as this offering goes out, and anyone who may or may not have had thoughts of interference, may they be pacified by this delicious food, even if the obstacle was just my superstitious mind itself. Yeah, other, other thoughts about that section, and that is kind of the, one of the more bewildering se sections, and I do recommend asking your local Geshis to talk about it. Um, but have you heard other things or um, had questions or ideas about that section? Sure. What do you what do you do with the food after it's been there for like a couple of days or something? You just, what do you do with it? Um, you can, you just leave it there. <laughs> you just leave <laughs> just, it there. Okay. Some, yeah. some animals will probably come get it, but animals are going to probably get it. That's well, okay. It's, it's not offered to them. So whether they get it or not is none of our business. We are not offering it to them. And okay. it's up off the ground to try and right. prevent that from happening. Right. Um, I mean, I've had some really interesting experiences with the leftover SOG where I put it out and then I come back like a minute later, it's gone. And I'm like, whoo, what? Was it a bird? A plane? A bikini? Who took it? Who can say? And of course, I've had the very human thing of it staying there for weeks and weeks and lots of ants coming and just wondering, is this the correct thing to do? But the teachers <laughs> say, leave it. So I just leave it. Leave it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. But indeed, keep asking these questions. I in no way have all the answers. It's just uh, logistically um, I know some things that we're taught to do, and I trust the teachers that they know what they're doing, but it could be that there are also um, a lot more commentaries that would help us connect to these practices more deeply. So the remaining song part is a very short part. Um, it's a very noisy part. There's a lot of movement in that part. And if you're in a position of helping a center, just make sure you're oriented about which which part of the practice to stand up and gather the remaining sog and just kind of be oriented about newer students won't know that they're supposed to take some of their sog, have a little bite and put it on the plate. So it might be good to make sure your helpers are all really oriented so that they can just gently whisper it to new people or that there's an announcement at the beginning if you know there's lots of new people. Because a lot of this is wanting to make sure that the things that are secret, you keep secret, but the things that are just confusing, tell people, right? Secret things keep secret, but they're only secret because of wrong views that will be developed because of people learning about them too soon without enough context. 
So it's not secret because we're ashamed or secret because it's bad or secret because we don't think you'll understand. It's that lots of context is needed to meet that information correctly. So we put it to one side somewhat behind, preserves its sacredness and its power. But a lot of the stuff that's just kind of confusing, it can be very off-putting to new students and they feel not included or they feel like they're doing the wrong thing. And so we wanna make sure we feel just really lots of warmth and lots of um, no big deal explanations and say things like, at this point, this happens. There's lots of reasons why. I know some of the reasons, not all of the reasons. We'll find about it in the fullness of time, but when the guy comes around, take a bite and put it in. <laughs> you know, just matter of fact, clear explanation, I think is really helpful for not alienating, alienating new people. Oh yeah, um, there, is, there is a suggestion that we don't talk to each other while distributing the song. That's certainly the case that you don't wanna, well, obviously be causing arguments during an offering ceremony. To not talk to each other is ideal, but when you see someone's confused and developing negative states of mind, to have a little short whispered conversation about what to do, or else to just don't worry about it and move on. Don't just like wait there with your plate and expect them to understand. Either gently, quietly explain it to them or just move on to the next person. So, so definitely you want to keep that process as sacred and non-chaotic as possible and refrain from speaking if you can but it's that balance of what is going to help the group energy and what's going to create dissonance and if there are many confused grumpy people it's going to be harder to focus and do the practice for the senior students as well so there's you know you just common sense certainly never have a fight during SOG <laughs> never have a fight during SOG and if someone is doing something different to how you're doing it, just let it be. Um, if you can gently explain something without it causing a drama, do, but harmony is more important than most things, <laughs> yeah. um, especially at Dharma centers. Harmony is far more important than being right. Um, there's very few things that are worth the argument, especially during a ceremony, because we're trying to go deeper than that nonsense. You know, and so if it's like later, a week later, you can say, oh, during that one part, we actually do this at this center because of these reasons. And it's just a nice chatty sharing of information, nice and light, no judgment, just logistics. That's the the way to approach it not like a heavy thing of did you know Lama Zopa said it's terrible heavy karma if you do raw you know and it's like <laughs> just keeping it really friendly <laughs> really friendly yeah and know your audience yeah who are you talking to so I think I think we all know the the unfortunate stereotype of the church lady <laughs> Right? the unfortunate stereotype of the church lady. We do not want to become the Dharma police, which is our version of being the church lady. Yes, who's like, you know, like a school marm. Um, so much of Buddhism, 99.9% .9 of Buddhism is about what you're doing in your mind. Very little is about the out outer display of that. You just want it to be in alignment with that. Yeah, so gently, gently. And uh, he said, we follow our guru's advice the best we can without being uptight or shaming people that don't know that advice. <laughs> um, so then I thought maybe briefly we could do some intro to some highest yoga tantra ideas that are okay for a general audience, just because a lot of that information already exists out in the world and maybe it will make it less confusing and less likely that there's wrong views. So, um, you know, grain of salt, all of this. This is the word that is the most problematic. This word, consort, wisdom mother or wisdom father, this is the most misunderstood part of Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, Tantra specifically. So it refers to the partner, quote, partner, either male or female, usually female, in the Buddha couple, such as Vadudatu Ishvari, Vairachana's consort, Sometimes the father and mother in the Buddha father mother couple are considered different divine beings. Sometimes only the double manifestation of a single being. So already you're realizing we are not talking about an ordinary human samsaric romantic relationship. We're talking about 
method and wisdom being combined. So when you see two deities in union, sometimes it's two divine beings representing two different things. Sometimes it's a double manifestation of the single being. The Buddhist belief is that all beings, whatever their superficial sexual identity, are potentially both male and female. Each has a male and female aspects and energies in his or her being. The empathic ability to transcend sexual identity habits is cultivated by tantric archetype meditation, wherein a male will meditate on himself as a female archetype Buddha, a female will meditate on herself as a male archetype Buddha, and both will meditate on themselves as male and female Buddha couple in union. So this is all to break down ordinary appearance and grasping. So then when we talk about people who were consorts or wisdom mothers, we're talking about usually heart disciples or fellow practitioners. The most famous example being Padmasambhava, Guru Rinpoche, and his two heart disciples who were teachers in their own right, Princess Mandarava from India and Princess Yeshitsogal from Tibet. And so when you see images like this with deities in union, the main layer of meaning to understand is that the female aspect represents wisdom, the male aspect represents method, and them being together in union like this means that, that wisdom and method must be practiced and eventually united. So don't get weird about it is the point. So this Buddha father mother couple can refer to a single enlightened individual as two beings, male and female in union. This is not as puzzling as it might seem. If we remember that the enlightenment transmutation is a passage from being a bounded singular self-centered individual, usually with one sexual identity or another in a given life into being an infinite multi-bodied, omnipresent, universalized individual capable of manifesting whatever embodiment interacts most beneficially with whomever. The manifestation of a pair in sexual union indicate, intends to demonstrate the union of wisdom and compassion, showing the capacity to adopt all beings, helping them out of the life cycle of suffering and giving them a new life of happiness in the Buddhaverse. So this is from Robert Thurman from his translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So the recap here is that goddess, dakini, wisdom mother are terms that have layers of meaning that differ depending on context. Buddhist Tantra involves utilizing the energy that accompanies negative states of mind like attachment while also realizing emptiness then generating positive states of mind like compassion while holding the bliss of attachment in order to destroy attachment, ordinary appearance and grasping. So the famous summary quote for this tantric practice is that it's like a termite born from wood eats the wood. And all Buddhist tantric practice must be informed by and imbued with the three principal aspects of the path. So renunciation, the determination to be free, bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, and the correct view, which is the wisdom realizing emptiness. And without these three principal aspects of the path, Tantra is completely destructive or just doesn't work or is incredibly problematic. So these foundational practices are essential. Okay. So there's a lot of good source material for these kind of things. Um, there's lots about Tsog from Lama Zopa, lots about Tantra that's useful from the Burrs and archives, some more about Kadrila and Yeshisogel and Mandrava if you're interested. And then these two books are mainly about the transformations of consciousness that happen during the dying process related to Tantra. And then in this class, um, this union of bliss and emptiness that I mentioned, that's just for people with highest yoga tantra. But these other ones I really recommend for you guys that are interested, particularly the world of Tibetan Buddhism. And then Manjushri's innermost secret is just for people with highest yoga tantra. 
but Dharma Matters by Jan Willis and the Foundation of Buddhist Practice have really good stuff for a general audience. So all of these Tantra ideas, just keep remembering that the point is bodhicitta. Is it a method to get me enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings? Is it informed by renunciation, the determination to be free from samsara? Does it have the correct view? Is it helping me realize emptiness? If those three aren't there, then your tantric practice is really has a lot of faults and can be very dangerous and actually make samsara more reinforced. So with practices like Guru Puja, just kind of stay with the layer of understanding and practice that you feel comfortable with and don't force the other things, don't go into the other things until you've had empowerment and lots of explanations because even the most surface layer of this practice is incredibly powerful. So connecting with the teacher, connecting with yourself as able to hear wisdom, that inner guru, outer guru connection, that's the main thing. This is a question from the first session. I just missed one thing. You said uh, with the visualization, um, Lama San Tuang Dorje Chang, is that Shakyamuni Buddha at his heart? Is that Lama San Kappa at, at his, you called it a three something and I missed it. Yes. That. Yes, the three concentric beings of Lama Losang Tuan Dorje Chan is Lama Sunkapa, then Shakyamuni Buddha, then Vajradhara. Vajradhara. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if, and again, you know, with all of this many into one golden light, <laughs> you know, and then details to develop over time. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? basic logistical ones, deep existential ones. Yeah, Christine, go ahead. Uh, this is off topic, but you did teach it earlier. I just wanna know when's the best time to do the Medicine Buddha, um, to do the uh, confession of the Medicine Buddha, is it in the morning or at night? Are you talking about um, the 35 Buddhas of confession? Yeah. In, yeah, yeah, and then you do yeah. Medicine Buddha yeah. after? Yeah, Anytime or does you it think matter? It time, but in the morning is great. Yeah, the, okay. the kind of the, the general rule is your morning confession is 35 Buddhas, your evening confession is Vajrasattva. Okay, thank Generally you so speaking. much. Yep, so thank you can you. purify in the morning, purify at the night. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, other questions? And are there, um, Diane, I think was asking about dedications. You wanted to talk a bit about dedications, was that right? Yeah. And um, with, with dedications, I guess there's a few schools of thought. One of them is you need to de dedicate individually and specifically for every tool that you need on the path to enlightenment. The other school of thought is you just dedicate everything that you're doing for enlightenment and you don't have to be so specific. And there's a good argument for both and either. And what you're really doing is if you have time and space, dedicate individually and specifically all the different kinds of dedication that there are that Lama Zopa re recommends. It's, it's powerful, it's meaningful to think all of the virtue you've created is really being sent to your enlightenment and in the meantime, this, 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 this. But don't feel trapped by the need to do that. Dedication can also be just a thought, like a five second thought. May all of this that happened go towards my enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, which is empty. So dedication is very important, but the elaborate dedication is something that don't pressure yourself to do, but also don't let yourself off the hook from doing. Because there is a reason that Lama Zoparim Sheikh can spend an hour and a half on just dedicating. He's not just doing that, you know, for his own fun. He's doing that because he's trying to teach us something about the importance of dedication. So when you have the space to do it in a sincere way that's not going to aggravate the people in your life too much, do it. Yeah. Um, so when you're looking at the retreat prayer book, it's, it's a little bit of a delicate dance because you have the standard prayers, which pretty much always do the standard dedication prayers. So dedicating for enlightenment and dedicating remembering emptiness. Then there's extensive ones, additional ones, the final Lamrim prayer. All of these are wonderful to do. 
what I would do in terms of like a retreat context is cycle through these and one session do this next session do that next session do that so rather than doing them all at once as a chunk so if you're in the position of leading a practice and you're the one deciding how many dedications to do it's like you want to stretch the group a little bit but you don't want to push them into aversion Lama Zopa can get away with a lot more than we can get away with because he's just flooding the room with bodhicitta so we'll we'll go along with him dedicating for an hour and a half because he's just love bombing us and all of this amazing stuff is happening and he's uplifting us at the same time and you know it's a whole different experience when he's the one leading it when we're the one leading it we want to do it in a way that feels heart connected and genuine that is not letting ourselves off the hook being lazy but also is not just pushing and pushing and giving ourselves anxiety and tension and fatigue so you just use your best judgment and uh, some kind of dedication excellent more dedication excellent yeah, yeah. yeah amanda go ahead i just got a, a new property in the last six months and i'm tidying it up and to make it nice and um the ideas comes to me i'd like to offer that you know like to everything <laughs> And I wondered if there's a specific prayer that I could say um, as I'm going about this or when it comes to mind, just to reinforce what I'm doing. Because you're, you're sort of renovating and remodeling with the intention that this be somehow for Dharma work or something or? No, it's, 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 the, it's the outside. The house is fine. It's, it's like a it's like a sort of wildernessy, you know, there isn't, mm -hmm. and I'm just tidying, you know, tidying yeah. away bed wood and, you know, that stuff. And, but the idea is like for all the creatures out there, all the, yeah. that somehow that could be a blessing. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a twofold approach. One is to acknowledge that in the process of clearing, you might be harming a lot of sentient beings. So if you do the mantra that blesses the feet, yeah. Om Krisha Raghana Humri Soha. You can find it, I'm sure, in um, the daily prayers one. So if you'd say that a few times and then blow on the broom or the cutters or whatever is going to come in contact with the things you're clearing, just in case you hurt anything accidentally, then it helps with their rebirth. So that's mm -hmm. one practice. And then the other practice is to think, may all of this energy and momentum and connection I'm making with these sentient beings benefit all of us for our path to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So um, medicine Buddha is always wonderful for animals and insects, even if mm -hmm. it's just medicine Buddha mantra. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're wanting to dedicate at the end of the day, any dedication is gonna be great, but probably Shanti Deva's dedication prayer would be particularly applicable. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Venerable Yanchen, you said a couple of times, I believe, that um, in order to have the uh, go forward to have tantric empowerments, uh, or in any way, shape, or form, that the three principal aspects of the path, renunciation, bodhicitta, and wisdom realizing emptiness, you use the word informed. People need to be informed of that. And I'm wondering if you would be so kind as to say a little bit more about what is meant by that because there's i mean to realize all those things would would just take endless numbers of eons as the as they say um to to hear the words you know is over on this side and at, at what how do you know when you kind of might have enough um and can veer off there when you're practicing yeah. here with yeah it's, with, a, it's a good question people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a good question. And, you know, it, it's the three principal aspects of the path are, you know, technically you should have a realization of them before you practice Tantra. Mm -hmm. Logistically, that's almost never the case these days with the degenerate age. Mm -hmm. What you do need is to have studied the three enough mm -hmm. that you understand them in a workable way okay. and have conviction in the truth okay. of them and are actively bringing them into your life. Oh, so okay. it's not a realization, but it's a firm respect and belief and adherence to those three as being absolutely true and absolutely vital for your path. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it's understanding plus conviction. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Understanding plus conviction. I'm, I'm finding myself wanting to focus more on the basics and wanting to just go back through the LAM rim again. And, again, my, you know, Lama at Zopa says, it, I think you should do it 300 times. <laughs> so rather, you know, there's all these other kind of like classes on emptiness and, you know, all these other like, uh, more advanced topics and I'm always like oh maybe I should study that but you know so you know do, is this a common do you have this kind of problem like you know you like to focus you've taught, yeah you've taught me go back to the commentaries if your practice gets boring that's one thing that's a gem that yeah. I got from you and yeah. that has been a, a huge gift in my life and I want to thank you for that I didn't have any idea my practice has gone to a whole nother level, just the things that I always do. But now I do them in such a different way. But yet I also wanna be pushing myself, you know? So what's yeah. that, can you talk a little bit about that kind of that, that edge? Well, it, it's, it's one of these things where you wanna ask yourself, what is giving you life? Yeah, what is giving you life in your practice? And sometimes your advanced practices that you've been doing in a curse way you right. have mental space to add layers and depth and nuance to them and so go with that momentum and pursue those commentaries and just take it to its natural conclusion until you feel full you know and you're like okay I've studied enough about Chittamani Tara that I can bring some more depth into my practice but if I keep studying these commentaries I'm going to overwhelm my system I won't be able to put them into practice right away and I'll forget a lot of it anyway I've learned enough new things to go more deeply so let's just let it be and digest and continue and then you ask yourself what are the parts of my practice that are missing life you know missing life force vitality joy connection and what is that related to in terms of topics on the path? And, you know, if you're getting distracted a lot or if you're feeling really, um, I don't know, needy or drawn to various things that are sort of um, obviously attachment things, then you might say, okay, I'm trending in an attachment way. I need to study and practice more on renunciation. And I already know what renunciation is and I've already studied it a whole bunch, but obviously I've got some stuff coming up, which is inviting me to go more deeply with it than I have before. So let's make renunciation the project, you know, or whatever, right? So you're just using your life to help inform oh. the direction that you're going so that you're going with the momentum of your life, not against it. You know, what, oh. what we want to do is stay yeah. active and engaged with our study and our practice but not pushing or forcing or completely drifted off and just kind of taking it for granted. That, that mm -hmm. kind of razor's edge of enough effort to keep you sparky, but not so much effort that you're getting overwhelmed. And mm -hmm. it's gonna vary day to day, mm -hmm. but if you can kind of figure out your own way of pacing, then the content you can decide with a lot more skillfulness. Oh, thank you, that makes sense. So it's dynamic, there's no recipe, it's a dynamic. Yeah. And it's personal. It's like, like, where's that Dakini energy? You know, where's that? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I was always looking for a recipe. <laughs> you also could just start with the long rim, start at the beginning and just work your way through it again. You know, there well, is a I have. You want. And I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. in a group. But the, anyway, you, yeah. that's very, very helpful. Thank you so much. I love your, um, your suggestions. They're very helpful. You really helped me. Thank you. Well, Thanks, everybody. And um, it's, it's been nice doing this course with you. And this is, of course, the pilot version of this Exploring Buddhism module. So the, the content I pulled together is in an experimental form. If there are things that you would like more of or less than, please do write Mary Ellen and she'll forward it to me because then we can tweak it for when it's not the pilot program, when it actually becomes the curriculum. So you had to cope with my curriculum development such that it is. And so feedback is welcome. And um, Thanks everybody for practicing with me. It was really a lovely group. We'll go ahead and dedicate. John Chu Sam Chorim Poshe, Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyochi, Ke Pan Yam Pame Pahia, Gone Gondu Pelwa Show. Tony Dawarim Poshe, Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyochi, Ke Pan Yam Pame Pahi. 
Gone, gone, do Pelwa and show. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world. The incomparably kind, supreme Tenzin Gatso. May you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjina's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three sublime ones, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Lizzie.